Carvela from uh, Paris Observatory. And we were walking over to a pub uh, a couple of days ago and figured out that we have been here together um, at a conference in 1999 on, uh, on, on the SIM uh, mission at the time and working on interferometry. Um, we had both forgotten that we were there at the same time, but you know, that's what you get with age. So um, Pierre, go ahead. Thank you very much, Anthony. So indeed, after these great talks, I will continue along the same line by presenting you uh, some example applications of a combination of hypercose Gaia astrometry and radial velocities. So it's, uh, you have seen already that it's a very powerful combination, um, but um, I will present it in a slightly different uh, angle. Uh, that is the, the proper motion anomaly that is not an acceleration, it's more a difference in velocity, it's not so different, but as a, uh, there's a, a slight uh, difference yet still. Uh, and how we can identify uh, stellar and substellar companions uh, using this, uh, this indicator. And I will present some um, applications to, to individual stars so that you can see how, how it uh, how it is in reality, how it works in reality. In particular, one star that I'm especially interested in, Proxima Centauri, one of my favorites, um, and also other nearby stars and how what we can tell about their, their exo, exoplanets. And I will finish with a slightly different uh, uh, instrument, which is the gravity instrument. It's an interferometric uh, beam combiner that is installed at the VLTI in Chile. And uh, how we can use this astrometry uh, collected with this instrument uh, together with radial velocities to, uh, in, in the case of the Beta Pictoris system. So if you want to tweet, you can, <laughs> no problem. There's no secret, uh, secret uh, results here. Um, so you have seen this kind of plot before, but uh, I'll quickly go through. If you have a single star uh, moving in space without companion, then its trajectory is linear and uniform. And therefore, uh, the measurements that you, uh, that, that, that you do of its proper motion at the hypercos or at the Gaia epoch, or the third one that you can compute from the difference in position between hypercos and Gaia, they will all three be uh, identical. So we, you, you can compute differential quantities, but they, all, they are all zero in this case. But of course, if you have a companion, uh, let's say a planet, for instance, orbiting uh, a star, then the, the star and the planet orbit their common center of mass. And therefore, you will have an orbit of the star around the center of mass and basically of the photocenter of the system, neglecting the, the planet uh, flux uh, around this uh, center of mass. And this is what will be measured by Hipparchos and by Gaia. That's the position of the star, not the planet, but the star, and its displacement around their common center of mass. So in this case, the, the proper motions that are measured at the Hipparchos and Gaia, Gaia uh, epochs will be slightly different because of, of the motion of the photocenter of the system around the center of mass. You still have access to this third quantity, which is the difference, uh, which is computed from the difference in position at Hipparchos and Gaia epochs, separated by about 25 years. And you can compute in this case, these differential quantities between the almost instantaneous measurements done by Hipparchos and Gaia and this long-term mean proper motion. And therefore you obtain these uh, red uh, row quantities here and here that are good proxies, not perfect, but good proxies of the orbital velocity of the photocenter around the center of mass, let's say of the star around the center of mass. And this velocity, it is induced by the presence of a companion. So if you use the laws of Kepler very simply, you can uh, 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 derive this, uh, this relation between the mass of the companion that induces this velocity on the primary star uh, and the mass of the primary star here. So the ratio between the secondary mass and the square root of its orbital radius, assuming a circular orbit, is, is uh, proportional to the square root of the mass of the primary star and to uh, its tangential velocity anomaly. So this little red vector that I've shown. So what kind of accuracy can we achieve uh, with, let's say, let's focus on the Gaia DR3. 
um, the, uh, the median accuracy that, that we have on the hyperco stars is 56 micro arc second per year. That translates, uh, if you express it a little differently, into 26 centimeters per second per parsec of distance. So a star at one parsec, you measure it this uh, proper motion anomaly to, with an accuracy of 26 centimeters per second. At 10 parsecs, it's 2.6 meters per second. And then if you translate this accuracy into, um, uh, into a, a mass, a mass, let's say, at five astronomical uh, units of orbital radius, because you have this degeneracy between mass and orbital radius, then you, you obtain a sensitivity of 10 Earth masses per parsec. Uh, this is for a solar mass primary star. So this gives an order of, of magnitude of the type of precision that, that we can achieve. Uh, I think this is not started with the uh, time, <laughs> just, just to, so that I'm not too long. Um, and this, uh, this, um, uh, this technique has not an infinite uh, sensitivity, of course. And actually, it has a sensitivity that depends on the orbital period of the companion. Because uh, you, if you remember, the, the data produced and provided in the DR3 are average over a period of about three years. And therefore, you, you have a decreased sensitivity to, to companions that have orbits uh, shorter than this, let's say, 1,000 day uh, length. So you see that on this plot that shows the, the, the sensitivity, let's say, in terms of, of, uh, um, of Earth mass as a function of orbital radius, for a given velocity anomaly here of 26 centimeters per second uh, for a solar mass star at one parsec, you are sensitive uh, to uh, about uh, 10 Earth masses for orbital radii between approximately three and uh, let's say 20 astronomical units. But for shorter orbital radii, so shorter orbital periods, then you are limited by the, the smearing due to the averaging of uh, over the uh, the, the three years of the Gaia uh, data acquisition. And here, this, this orange line is the duration of the Gaia DR3 uh, window. And at the longer uh, uh, orbital uh, period uh, uh, side, you are limited by the fact that you subtract the hypercos Gaia uh, long-term proper motion. And doing this subtraction, in fact, you subtract part of the signal that you want. You subtract part of the curvature of the trajectory of the star, so you are less sensitive to the long period, uh, to, to the long period uh, companions. So basically, when you, when you observe a tangential velocity anomaly, let's say this one, you know that uh, you have a companion whose mass is somewhere in the green shaded area here, but you don't know exactly where. You know that there's a probability, a somewhat higher probability that it is in this part here that is more sensitive, but it can also be a longer period, more massive companion due to this degeneracy. So let's, let's apply that to a, a real case, um, Proxima Centauri. So this is a, a red dwarf, a very low mass star that is known to have uh, three planets uh, from B, C, and D. Uh, with periods ranging from five days to five years. And uh, here we will focus on the uh, Proxima C planet because the two others with these very short periods are, are not uh, detectable with Gaia at all. But the, the third one uh, with this uh, five years period is in principle in the best sensitivity range of, uh, of, uh, of Gaia. So here in these two, two diagrams here, we see the radial velocity signal measured on Proxima B, so the 11 day period, and the uh, candidate planet uh, Proxima C with its period of 5.2 years. So uh, if we look into a little bit into uh, numbers, so I don't ask you to read all the numbers, but if you want to do a calculation afterward, you, you can compare uh, here. Uh, we obtain a transverse velocity residual. So you know this little red vector that I showed in the beginning. Uh, for the DR2 data of 2.7 plus or minus 1.5 meter per second. Uh, and for the DR3, so using a, a larger set of data, we obtain a velocity anomaly of 0 0.4 plus or minus 0 0.5 meters per second. Uh, 
So basically here with the DR3, we don't see a significant signal. And with the DR2, we don't see also a significant signal, but it's, it's a little more. Um, just one remark here, to do this computation on Proxima, there are some really nice effects to take into account. First, you have the perspective acceleration, which is a geometrical effect uh, that uh, uh, is due to the fact that the, the, velo the radial velocity of the star progressively transfers to the tangential velocity as the star is passing by. But this is a geometrical effect, that's quite easy. But also you have to take into account the fact that at the Hipparchos epoch, uh, Proxima was slightly farther from us, and therefore the Hipparchos position has to be corrected for the light travel time, that, that additional light travel time at this epoch. And if you don't do this correction, you don't obtain the correct uh, residual velocity. And I think that's really nice to have this accuracy. And just to give you a, a, a feeling, Proxima is going through, through space at about 30 kilometers per second. And we have this wonderful agreement at a 0.5 meter per second level between Hipparchos Gaia, the mean proper motion and the measurement by Gaia, which I find is really very really impressive. So if we can look at how it compares these, these, uh, these results in terms of tangential velocity to uh, uh, the properties of Proxima C, so uh, determined from the radial velocity uh, curve. So it's the same diagram as, as uh, before. We see here the, the mass here and the orbital radius and the, the shaded domains uh, represent the possible one sigma uh, uh, domains for the companions in terms of mass and orbital radius. And what we see is that we have Proxima C from radial velocity that stands here. And that is compatible with this kind of uh, tangential velocity anomaly that we obtain of uh, 0.4 meter per second but we don't have yet the, uh, the sensitivity to really detect it. One, one uh, limitation, however, is that you see Proxima C is rather close to this peak here because its period of five years is relatively close to the Gaia window of three years. And therefore we have a, decreased, a decrease in sensitivity due to averaging over the Gaia window. So we can expect that in the DR4 where this averaging will not be uh, done. We will have access to the individual measurement epochs. We will not have this limitation and therefore be able to, uh, to, to detect Proxima C uh, directly in, uh, in, in the Gaia data. So Proxima C, probably it's something like a Neptune planet. So another example, uh, still another very famous star that we heard about a few times uh, this week, Epsilon Eridani. So Epsilon Eridani is very nice because it has a long period planet detected by Hatsis in 2000 and confirmed by Maui in 2019. You see here the radial velocity curve that is really beautiful and a very long period. So it's a long effort, long term effort to, to have this kind of curve. And uh, if we plot here on this diagram, uh, the same mass as function of orbital radius, we see that the properties of Epsilon Eridani B uh, determined from radial velocities are very well in line with the um, signal that we detect both from Gaia DR3 in green and from Hipparchos in light blue here. The shaded areas here are the domains that are of presence of companions that are excluded from direct imaging. So basically what it means is that for Epsilon Eridani, once you consider this planet here, you can subtract it, its contribution, and you see that there's not, not much remaining. So you can basically exclude, uh, exclude any uh, other massive planet in the Epsilon uh, system from, this, uh, from these measurements. Another star that we just heard about a, a very short uh, time uh, ago, Epsilon Indy. Epsilon Indy is very nice because it's a, a triple star with a binary brown dwarf and a, a, a regular dwarf a main comp component, Epsilon Ind A. And Epsilon Ind A has a companion that is an exoplanet at a mass of approximately three Jupiter mass. And we, we see it uh, in the uh, Gaia DR2 and DR3 data uh, as, as shown here. And the detection by Feng uh, falls very well onto the sensitivity curve uh, of uh, that, that we that we determine. 
Now, um, you, you know now that there is a, a very nice and very complete, and, and not, not fully complete, but a very nice catalog of non-single stars in the Gaia DR3. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this catalog is based on the epoch astrometry of Gaia. So it's very different from the analysis that we do here, that is based on average quantities over the three years. Here, it, uh, the, the individual measurements of Gaia were used just as presented uh, by uh, Mirek uh, just before. And this is one of the example uh, planets that were detected uh, and, and, and presented in the Gaia DR3 of HD 810040. And uh, you see this is the orbit of the star around the center of mass of the system. And this is from this orbit that it's possible to determine the properties of the planet. And this planet is an eight Jupiter mass companion on approximately a 1000 day orbit. So this is interesting, this 1000 day period, because it's something at the interface where the sensitivity of our proper motion anomaly uh, technique uh, based on Hipparchos and Gaia decreases significantly. But however, we can detect this uh, planet in terms of uh, a proper motion anomaly in the Gaia DR2 data here, this, uh, this uh, uh, blue uh, sensitivity curve. Here, this is the, the actual properties of the planet determined from this. And you see that uh, we are compatible with this, uh, with this uh, planet properties. But in the DR3, that is based on a longer uh, time window, three years instead of approximately two years, we see that we have this mirroring that diminishes, that decreases our sensitivity. And then we have uh, more difficulties. We have, uh, it's more difficult to detect the planet from the DR3 than from the DR2 in this particular case. Now let's uh, uh, focus to a little different approach that is applicable to binary stars for which uh, it's uh, possible to have uh, astrometry of both components separately. So this is the case, for instance, of uh, the famous binary 61 Cygni A and B. And 61 Cyg has uh, measurements obtained with Hipparchos here uh, with uh, orange arrows, with Gaia DR2, with the light blue arrows and with Gaia DR3 with the green arrows. So you see the proper motion of the pair here in 25 years. And then the proper motion in the, let's say six months approximately between the reference epochs of DR2 and DR3. And then you see <coughs> the orbital motion vectors of the two stars that were obtained by subtracting the proper motion of uh, the barycenter of the system. So this is uh, uh, shown here on this plot on, on the right, a little uh, a zoom uh, on the Gaia uh, data here. And you see that uh, we, we obtain uh, orbital velocity vectors for both A and, and B components. And in principle, in a binary star like that, if you have orbital velocity vectors, they are collinear, they are aligned, they have different uh, lengths and orientation, but they are uh, aligned with each other uh, and their uh, norm is inversely proportional to the mass of each component. But in this case, what we see is that the two vectors of A and B are not collinear. One has a small angle with respect to the other. And this uh, could indicate the presence of a companion orbiting either uh, 61 sig A or B. Uh, we cannot say which one of the two uh, in, in, in a sort of orbital velocity anomaly uh, approach here. But if we do the, the computations, we see that this orbital velocity anomaly has a norm of approximately 88 meters per second. Uh, that is uh, very stable between DR2 and DR3, and we also an orientation that is quite uh, uh, constant uh, between the two releases. And if we uh, translate that in terms of companion of possible companion mass as a function of orbital radius, we obtain this green shaded curve here. And uh, if we superimpose the domains that are excluded by uh, radial velocity searches, which is the blue domain here, and by the instability uh, induced by the presence of a second star of a 61 sig B, for instance, then we are left with a domain of, of possible uh, 
presence of companions that has a small overlap with our uh, velocity anomaly uh, uh, prediction. And we could maybe think that there is a 10 Jupiter mass uh, planet orbiting either A or B uh, at a distance of about 10 to 20 astronomical units of one of the two stars of 61 sig A and B. And just uh, as, a, as a remark, I can put here the prediction of Strand in 1963 that falls uh, here. Uh, and you see that it's compatible with the Gaia uh, orbital velocity anomaly, but uh, it's excluded by radial velocity. So that's it. It's likely not, not this solution that is the right one. So now that we have done this kind of Uh, proper motion anomaly analysis for all stars of the Gaia cata of the Hipparchos catalog. So that's 117,000 approximately. We can make statistical uh, plots like this histogram. Here we show the <coughs> mass of the companion at normalized at an orbital radius of five astronomical units that represents more or less the best domain of sensitivity for, for almost all stars. And here you have the number of stars in each bin. And you see that there is a, a broad range of, of, uh, of companion masses uh, up to the uh, stellar domain, of course. And the, the different shades of blue correspond to different levels of signal to noise detection. So if we focus on the uh, high level of signal to noise of five, we see that we have a, a really large number of, of, of uh, companions detected. And if we zoom in, to the very lower mass domain here, we see that in this range, we have between several hundred and several thousand candidate companions that are uh, with masses below 10 Jupiter mass. So this is, uh, this is quite significant. So now, uh, if we combine now the proper motion anomaly uh, astrometric approach with uh, the search for resolved companions in the Gaia catalogs using uh, by identifying common proper motion uh, stars. So stars that are likely bound gravitationally together. We can uh, detect them separately in the Gaia catalog, compare their proper motion, their parallax, uh, check if they can be bound and therefore um, detect their, uh, their, their, their relation in this way. We have in this uh, uh, diagram, the sensitivity in terms of mass to, of a companion as a function of orbital radius. Here it's for a very low mass star located at 10 parsec. And you see that in this case, uh, we have a sensitivity from the proper motion anomaly that goes down to about 0.1 Jupiter mass. And uh, from the common proper motion uh, search approach, so just resolved companions, we have a sensitivity that is a, a, a little uh, above 10 Jupiter mass. So you see that we are uh, uh, exhaustive in the search for companions uh, at the stellar, sorry, at the stellar mass uh, level for, uh, for stars up to 100 parsec uh, at all separations from, from small separation to high separation. And for a one solar mass star at 10 parsec, we are still uh, uh, sensitive to essentially all objects nearly down to the planetary mass limit of let's say 13 uh, Jupiter mass um, uh, at, at all separations with a better sensitivity, of course, uh, with a proper motion anomaly for closing uh, objects. Uh, another indicator of binarity that you have heard already about is the RUVI. Uh, that is a, a statistical indicator that is provided for each star in the Gaia catalog. And here we show in this uh, uh, histogram the number of stars uh, with uh, uh, this value of the RUV for different levels of uh, signal to noise in proper motion anomaly. And just uh, on the right diagram, this is a, a, a summary, let's say, of a fraction of stars that have a proper motion anomaly as a function of their RUV. And you see that this proportion of stars with anomaly increases very much uh, even before the, the usual limit of 1.4 in RUV. So even if you have a star in the Gaia catalog that has a RUV of about 1.2, there is about half, uh, half uh, probability that it has uh, an anomaly and that it has a, a companion. 
So uh, now we can combine uh, all these indicators, so proper motion anomaly, the common proper motion uh, candidate uh, approach, and the Ruby. And using all these indicators, we can uh, conclude that over the Hipparcos catalog, there are 43% uh, of the star that exhibit at least one of these, uh, of these binarity indicators. So this is a very significant fraction. And it shows that uh, yeah, binarity cannot be uh, ignored, uh, but that's, uh, that's not new. Okay. And of course, uh, you have heard that many results are, are coming out, and that's really great. We have uh, results from the uh, from, for instance, from Tim Brandt, uh, from uh, Fane Curry, and from uh, Dino Mesa recently, with discoveries based on the identification of companions from proper motion. And this is really a, a wonderful application of, uh, of the Gaia uh, proper motion measurements. Now let's focus on a very uh, important and very famous system, Beta Pictoris. Beta Pictoris uh, is very renowned because it has uh, two planets, B and C. This is an image of planet Beta Pictoric B here uh, uh, that was uh, discovered uh, with direct imaging. And you see here this vector, it's the uh, proper motion anomaly of Beta Pictoris from the Hipparchos data. Because as it was mentioned already, Gaia is not very, uh, very good on Beta Pic because it's too bright, the star is too bright. So Hipparchos provides a better proper motion at, at the moment. But, and computing the proper motion anomaly of Beta Pictoris, we see that it is very well compatible with the uh, properties of Beta Pic B as uh, determined by Snellen or Dupuis, for instance. So this is a, uh, yeah, this shows that Beta Pic B is present uh, in, the, uh, in the astrometry uh, data of, of Gaia and of Hipparchos. Now we can play a, a little game, a, a posteriori in a sense. We can subtract the known uh, properties. The, uh, we can subtract the proper motion anomaly of uh, beta peak caused by beta peak B, knowing the properties of beta peak B from radial velocity. So we can remove its signature from the proper motion anomaly and see what remains. And what remains is this green shaded domain here. And when combined with the, uh, the constraints from, uh, from radial velocity and direct imaging searches by uh, Lagrange that are shown with this blue line here, we obtain this domain of possible additional planets that is shown here with the shaded area in, in purple uh, of mass as a function of orbital radius again. And you see that this domain here excludes most of massive uh, planets uh, beyond uh, a few astronomical units, but there is a remaining possibility in this range here. And it turns out that Beta Pictoris C falls exactly in this range. So this is where the second planet was hidden and it, as it was found afterward. So uh, a quick uh, uh, background on Beta Pictoris. Beta Pic was discovered, uh, Beta Pic B was discovered by direct imaging and beta peak C was discovered by radial velocity. Um, now I, I will present you some results from gravity observation, so interferometry, astrometric interferometry, uh, on uh, beta peak B and C, and beta peak B was directed by, uh, by gravity observations, and beta peak C, in addition to being also directly detected, uh, it was also shown that its orbit is perturbed by the presence of planet uh, Beta Pic B. So this is really a, a wonderful uh, result that I, I will show you at the, at the end. So interferometry, you have had a, a very good presentation by Gail Schaeffer. Here we uh, have gravity at the Paranal Observatory that you see here. Uh, gravity uh, uses the light from four uh, of the, the four eight meter telescopes that are present here. Uh, connecting them, you know, with the, the yellow lines uh, symbolizing that. It collects the light from the four, four telescopes. And the special property of gravity is that it observes simultaneously two objects. It's in fact two interferometers together uh, and, and observing two different fields. Uh, 
and two different objects. And of course, in our case, one of the objects would be uh, Beta Pictoris A, the star, and the uh, other object will be Beta Pic B, the planet. So how does it work in practice, the observations with, uh, with gravity? Um, the first field, uh, the first uh, interferometric field is what we call the fringe tracker. It's used much as a wavefront sensor for adaptive optics. It is used to stabilize the effect of the atmosphere, the turbulence that affects the position of, of the fringes and moves them very, very quickly. So we use the, this, uh, this uh, channel of gravity to stabilize the fringes by watching uh, beta peak the star. Now we have a second field that uh, we can displace around the, the main, uh, the primary field uh, up to a distance of two arc seconds uh, with a unit telescope, with a big telescopes. And we obtain here a second system of interferometric fringes, one with a fringe tracker on the star, one on the planet with the science combiner here. And we can measure the difference in phase between the two fringe systems. And this difference in phase is related to the separation between the two objects. We still have one step to do is to link, to relate one of the fields to the other. And this is done by using an internal metrology that is uh, based on, on a very stable laser that goes all the way to the telescopes and back to the laboratory. And therefore we can obtain in this way the relative astrometry, so the relative position between the uh, star and the planet, and also spectro imaging of the planet. So you will see a very, very interesting spectrum of, of the planet. And just as a remark, uh, gravity uh, is, uh, is, uh, is an interferometric instrument and it has a very uh, interesting, important advantage over uh, adaptive optics is that can use the coherence of the light from the planet because the planet is very small angularly so its light is very coherent it can use the coherence of the light to uh, to separate the planet from the cloud of speckles of the, of the primary star so for this reason interferometry is in principle uh, more sensitive to point like sources like planets in the vicinity of bright sources so observations of beta pictoris b they took place uh, already uh, two years ago. Uh, and uh, they, they were done using four big telescopes uh, for only 1.5 hours. And we could obtain the position of Beta Pictoris B with an accuracy of 70 micro arc second relative to uh, the star Beta Pic. And from this measurement that is shown uh, here of relative position, we could derive uh, uh, improved orbital uh, parameters for the planet and in particular its mass combining with uh, either only relative astrometry, also with uh, intermediate uh, data from Hipparchos plus the Gaia DR2 and also combined with uh, uh, acceleration by uh, Tim Brandt. So this was a, a first application that, that worked already quite well. And it also provided a very good uh, quality spectrum of beta peak B uh, in the K band, in the infrared K band, where we see a lot of molecular, molecular bands. Now, beta pictoris C, it's a little bit the same story as beta peak B. Uh, it was detected uh, on several occasions that, we, that you can see here. These are uh, reconstructed uh, sort of images. It can be understood as interferometric images where you see the planet here as a peak uh, as a peak here uh, in these three, uh, in these three uh, maps here. So this was the first time a planet discovered by radial velocity was uh, imaged uh, by interferometry and detected first by interferometry. Here, the relative astrometry is not exactly as accurate. It's only 200 micro arc second accuracy, but still uh, quite, quite good. And uh, an orbital fit was done using the Orbitize uh, uh, tool uh, by Sarah Blunt, uh, including Hipparcos Epoch Astrometry, Gaia DR2, and Relative Astrometry. And you can see here this uh, the, the general uh, fit with here the uh, Hipparcos Epoch Astrometry, the Gaia Astrometry, the Radial Velocity, Relative, um, uh, relative Astrometry, and uh, the uh, the, the result uh, is, is actually uh, quite uh, quite nice. 
And uh, just to finish, there is a very uh, nice uh, effect that was detected in this system for the first time, I believe. It's the fact that the orbital trajectory of beta peak B is affected by the presence of planet beta peak C. And you can see here in this, um, in, in this plot, the separation as a function of, of time here of a year uh, for beta peak B, for the trajectory of beta peak B. And here you can see an, an enlargement of the residual of the, of the fit, Keplerian fit here in these in this, uh, windows here. And if you look carefully, the red curve here, it's the uh, fit with uh, beta peak B astrometry with one planet only. And you can see that this red curve does not go through the uh, gravity points very well. You see, you have points from gravity that are uh, away from this red curve. And to, to fit them properly, you have to add a second planet. You have to add uh, beta peak C. And therefore, you, you, we can say that we detected beta peak C from its perturbation on beta peak B. And knowing that this perturbation is only one milliard second in amplitude, approximately, this is quite an achievement. Uh, and uh, we could obtain a high uh, accuracy mass of uh, beta peak C, actually better than uh, beta peak B. So in, the, in summary, uh, we have uh, from this uh, combination of Hipparchos and Gaia, 43% uh, of the Hipparchos stars that show at least one signature of binarity. This is a high fraction and this has to be considered looking for, for planets or brown dwarfs, of course, but also looking for PSF calibrators, for instance, it can be useful to know. Uh, the catalogs are available uh, of proper motion anomalies uh, and accelerations uh, open to everyone. There are very nice tools to use them to, to do very focused, high, high quality analysis for, for special targets like Orbitize and Orvara. And we can say that the proper motion anomaly and uh, acceleration anom uh, approaches are very complementary to what is uh, presented in the DR3 non-single star catalog. Uh, for the longer orbital periods. And gravity now opens a, a very interesting uh, uh, possibility to measure the astrometry of planets around stars with a, a Gaia-like accuracy, uh, but focused on, on particular targets. Thank you very much. So we have one online question asking what code are you using to do the astrometric fits, which are producing the nice companion mass versus orbital radius plots? The first part, basically it's just asking what code you used to do the astrometric fits that produce the uh, companion mass versus orbital radius plots. Yes, this is a this is a code that I wrote, uh, but, but it's not uh, not public. But it's it's not very complicated. It's the same kind of code as the one used by Tim uh, to compute the differences between uh, between proper motions. Yes. I got a question on gravity. So very exciting results have come out of gravity. I'm always excited when I see a new target, but I'm always confused on how to use, how to apply for time. Can anybody apply for time? What's the gravity collaboration like and target selection like? Ah, uh, the way we set select targets. First, we select targets where uh, planets are, are known to be present. Uh, in general, I think most of the cases. Um, so this is a, uh, yeah, they, they have to be at a certain separation from their stars. So it, it limits the, the number of stars. We have also selected uh, some, some candidate targets from the, the proper motion anomaly list where we see that there is an acceleration. But the difficulty is that searching for the planet is, is time consuming. And when we use four big telescopes, uh, we want to be as efficient as possible. So it's better if we know already where the planet is. So if we have direct images, it's, it's much easier. 
Uh, if, but if we don't, it happened that we searched for the planet, like Beta Pixie, for instance. We searched for Beta Pixie and we found it. That's what was like that. But so it's not like, it's not open time. It's not like one could come up. You have to come to the gravity collaboration and say, hey, this is an awesome target. Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes, please. I, I think if you, you, you can really do that. Um, generally, it's, it's, a, it's a large program that we have here that's doing this kind of observation at Yatizo. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Oh, you can. That's a question. Yeah. It's open. It's, a, it's an ISO instrument. So anyone can apply to, to observe with gravity. And if you have a, a brown dwarf, for instance, that you want to observe near, near a bright star, it's, uh, it's very much possible. Okay. Yeah. All right. Quick question. For those 43% of Hipparchus stars that have signs of binarity, are most of them known binaries or does some really, I think of most of binary stars, are some of them just unknown and they need follow-up? Uh, yes, there, there is a fraction of, of these uh, percentage that are known already. Uh, many are, are uh, stellar mass companions, uh, but it's, it's a bit difficult to, to be really uh, categoric in, in, in my answer because it depends always on the distance. We, we are more sensitive to uh, binary companions for nearby stars than for distant stars. And hypercosc stars are spread at, uh, at all distances. So it's, it's not a, a nearby star catalog. So I, I would say that there are uh, many of these stars that are known binaries, but also many that are new ones uh, in, in, that, in this respect. Great. Thanks. All right, well, if there are no further questions, let's thank uh, Pierre uh, again for an excellent talk and <laughs>